delighted delighted to have all of you with us and and always thrilled to welcome back our uh, hospital epidemiologist, the director of infection prevention and control for the net for the downtown, the network in Brooklyn, um, and a professor of medicine in our own division of infectious diseases, a man who really needs no introduction and has been working nonstop since he got here, but in particular since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Waleed Javed. Dr. Javed, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weissman and Department of Medicine for inviting me for the grand rounds. It's uh, my pleasure to discuss a lot of things with you guys. Uh, when uh, uh, Minera asked me initially, um, we discussed a little bit what should be uh, in there, and then there were a few other viruses that came along. So we thought we'll do a viral disease uh, update uh, encompassing everything. So that also means there will be a lot of things to talk about. I'll speak very fast and efficiently. All right. Uh, let's see if I can move this thing now. All right. Yes. So disclosures, nothing pertaining to this presentation. Um, I wish there was like, I would say a million dollars or something, but nothing here. All right. So this guy, I like uh, Gulilio. I, I don't know exactly why, but uh, his quote specifically is all things are true after they are found. But the point is knowing how to find them. And that's kind of where we physicians, providers, especially infectious disease doctors, we're all, all doctors actually are at. So I thought uh, I'll start with a little bit of uh, introduction of viruses, just because I'm fascinated by how monkeypox looks. I put all the viruses in their uh, cartoons or whatever CDC thinks they should look like. Um, under electron microscope, they are not colored, but well, they put colors there. But this is how these viruses will look like, and these are the viruses we'll talk about extreme um, in, um, well, in a brief but reasonable introduction of these viruses. Just some shapes and sizes. The Ebola virus obviously is the biggest one, but uh, monkeypox virus uh, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, similar to variola virus. is a very big virus itself, as compared to SARS-CoV virus, influenza viruses, and all other viruses known to mankind. And uh, just just so that we know what we are dealing with here. All right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit. Uh, uh, slightly differently about all these viruses in like five sections each, which which is what is this? How bad is it? How does it spread? How do I protect myself? And how to protect the uh, protect the public and treat the patients in these situations? Uh, so it just gives a little bit of a framework. So what is this? It is a coronavirus. Unfortunately, we have seen this guy a lot more than we ever wanted to just some structural proteins and they are important because they are targeted for either treatments and or their targets for uh, for vac uh, vaccinations as well. Uh, actually, I, I made this slide uh, even before this, uh, uh, this virus was named, uh, uh, named uh, SARS-CoV-2. At that time, it was called 2019 novel coronavirus. And I kept it just as a reminder in uh, for, for me and for everybody else that this is pretty novel, pretty new. So just coronavirus timeline, I'm not gonna bore you guys too much, but uh, in 1962-63 timeframe, first coronavirus was discovered causing respiratory diseases from uh, some, uh, some common cold up to pneumonias and some deaths. Uh, it's not very clear how big of an impact was found at that time. But in 1965, uh, they also found a different coronavirus, slightly different uh, serological and uh, genetic markers on that. Uh, and then after that, there was a big break of non-discovery of human coronaviruses. There is a lot of other coronaviruses infecting animals that have been discovered in between. These are only the human coronaviruses. In 2003, we heard about SARS-CoV-1, an outbreak. And uh, then after that, there was a little bit more discovery about other coronaviruses, uh, mostly in China, but other areas as well in 2004 and 5. MERS-CoV in 2012 came along, uh, na uh, named Middle East uh, 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 respiratory 
uh, syndrome, coronavirus, um, and was related to camels or cattle, basically, and then uh, uh, causing infections in human, but didn't really spread too much. Uh, was very limited outbreaks in a few areas, including Korea. Uh, but then uh, in 2019, we all got uh, um, uh, got um, uh, introduced to this virus called um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. All right, so a little bit of timeline on the virus itself. Uh, in 2019, the pandemic starts and throughout the world it spreads within six months. Uh, just some important points in April 2020, if you guys remember before that, CDC was saying you don't really need to wear a mask uh, to public, but then that changed in 20. 20 April, and then by November 2020, EU, EUA was issued for first treatment, specific treatment, directed treatment for this virus. In 2020 December, uh, vaccine first vaccine was approved uh, 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 by Pfizer, and then by 2021. Um, uh, Paxil, Paxilvid uh, 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 com uh, combination or Ritonovir boosted uh, Nimrata where was approved for as first oral therapy. So just uh, looking at that, and then August 2022, EUA uh, uh, for first bivalent COVID vaccine or vaccines was uh, approved uh, or was authorized by by FDA. A lot of things have happened. I still remember. Uh, I still remember the time that uh, that we had. Uh, uh, that I also want to completely forget. Uh, in March of 2020, when we had an uptake of cases, uh, um, the there are two lines in in this chart, uh, and then there's some background. The two lines uh, show the black line actually is the cases, number of cases that were being detected. And then the, the red line is uh, the number of uh, 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 deaths. This These are both averaged over seven days, just to make it a little bit more uh, understandable. Initially in March 2020, we were not allowed to test a lot of patients uh, uh, and there was a lot more restrictions because we didn't have a lot of testing. So you can see there was a lot more mortality as compared to uh, the cases. Actually, both of these um, lines are on different scales. So, uh, just to understand, the red line is about 10% of the black line. So just to see how, uh, it, it, it's uh, just to show you uh, if, um, if the cases are occurring, uh, what is the percentage point? So um, around, um, around, uh, middle of uh, of this pandemic in July last year, June, July last year, we had about 1% cases uh, of uh, of patients who were detected dying from COVID. The, there are a few things uh, uh, to see here is initially mortality seems a little higher, going up to almost uh, 10 to 15% uh, as compared to the cases. But uh, those things do, do did change uh, over time when the masking requirement went into place. And then over time, a few patterns emerged that the deaths occur about a few weeks after uh, we see peaks. Uh, we saw a similar peak or high peak around uh, December and then uh, in in uh, uh, December of 2020 and then uh, December and January of 2021, we saw a huge peak of cases uh, with the Omicron surge. And then you can see the deaths did follow. Uh, but what what we have seen in recent uh, recently is that the mortality has gone uh, probably well below a percent of uh, of the cases being detected. We also know that majority of cases are actually not being reported. So this line only shows the reported cases. Majority of cases are actually being done with the home antigen tests. So a few things: uh, incubation period about uh, ten to 15, uh, about five days to fourteen days. But more recently, with Omicron, we have seen this push back to about three days. Uh, presentation can be uh, pretty much uh, as any other respiratory illness: uh, fever, chills, fatigue, cough, sore throats, shortness of breath, myalgias, and headaches, and so on and so forth. The new loss of taste and smell uh, has been a defining uh, sign, but it's not always present. Severity can be as uh, as severe as uh, as death, 
but uh, but uh, it could, uh, there are people who are infected but are asymptomatic. Resolution uh, usually is limited disease back to baseline. There are uh, there is a thing called long COVID, uh, which uh, is shown on the graphic on the right. You can see there sometimes the uh, both the, the viral shedding can be in can continue for a while, but also the um, but also the symptoms can continue for months and months and months after um, after the disease itself. And those uh, that those are some of the concerning signs and symptoms of this disease. So serious, uh, it's a serious medical issue uh, if uh, people get uh, serious symptoms, including um, um, uh, including exhaustion, shorter breath, losses, speech or mobility or confusion or chest pains. Those are things that we should tell our, our patients that if they have these symptoms, they should contact uh, or they should come to the hospital. Most commonly, as we discussed, fever, cough, tiredness, and loss of taste or smell, and less common symptoms, including aches and pains, uh, some skin rashes, some diarrhea, uh, uh, some conjunctivitis or headaches are common. O although with Omicron, more of headaches are uh, being considered uh, uh, as uh, as more more common uh, common uh, symptoms as well uh, so spectrum of illness from asymptomatic disease to critical illness and death and how does it spread there's been a lot of debate about the spread of covid itself or uh, the sars cov2 uh, virus and i looked at a lot of um, a lot of models um, what we do think that majority of spreads occurs by droplet transmission. It can occur in crowded areas, close contact uh, settings, confined in close uh, places with uh, poor ventilation. Um, and when these all these things overlap, the risk is higher. Uh, does it spread by airborne transmission? It's likely it does, but that's probably not the major mode of transmission. So masking, uh, just simple surgical masking has been found to be extremely effective, uh, although in, uh, in preventing, but uh, although in patients who have diagnosed COVID-19, we do recommend N95 uh, mask. We'll get into that. Uh, so if you're taking care of a patient with the uh, uh, with COVID-19, you uh, you should be wearing face shield goggles um, and uh, N95 uh, mask and uh, clean non-sterile uh, gowns and gloves. Our isolation gowns uh, should be worn, um, and 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 alternatives to this are also acceptable. Um, how to protect public and treat patients? We know a lot of treatments are available. Antibodies, including monoclonal antibodies, are pretty much miracle of this uh, this century. We've seen them being very effective during this uh, this uh, pandemic as well. Um, antivirals are available for treatment. IV remdesivir has been the mainstay of treatment for almost a year and a half, um, or actually longer. And oral therapies, including Paxlovid and Molnipovir from Merck, are now available. Immunosuppressants initially were thought you know, to be not the best, but can be used in treatment. Now, I've put all these names together, but there is a way of prescribing them. For outpatients, you'll be prescribing more Paxlovid Paxlovid in patients who are getting um, very, uh, who at different stages would be given different of, uh, different of these medications. So this is overgeneralization. The vaccines that are available include mRNA vaccines with uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, as well as Moderna. Uh, both of these actually have recently received EUA from FDA for bivalent vaccine. And those are uh, are important, and I'll discuss with, about them in, in a few seconds. Uh, but uh, there is a new vaccine available called Novavax. It's actually ranked in CDC conversations or in their documents now higher than Johnson and Johnson, and uh, and and preferred over Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which was also another vaccine developed by Johnson and Johnson Jensen vaccine. Monovalent vaccine uh, still has uh, has EUA. Pfizer uh, monovalent vaccine and Moderna monovalent vaccine both have received full authorization from FDA. Um, right, so 
a, a lot of people have asked about uh, what what uh, vaccination schedule uh, uh, should be followed for for majority of people who are not severely or moderately infected, especially uh, or immunocompromised, especially in terms of the boosters. Uh, uh, and CDC has tried to explain it many different ways. Every way is pretty much very confusing. But basically, if you are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, you can receive a booster after two months of fully fully vaccinated. If you have already received booster or boosters, you can still receive the bivalent booster now after two months of your last dose. Um, people... Um, who have received so it says about Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer BioNTech. You can see uh, it's approved from uh, of, of the boosters are now approved for people 12 years and older. Bivalent boosters, boosters for uh, for younger kids are uh, with the bivalent booster is still not approved, uh, and those will be coming uh, in 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 the. In, years to come but uh or months to come but that right now for bivalent boosters 12 years or older are required so primary series uh, two months later you can get the bivalent booster or primary series and booster you can still get the bivalent booster two 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 months after your last dose and then uh just some antivirals i really like this uh this graphic from good rx i'm not sponsoring them at all i don't endorse them or not endorse them, but I like this graphic showing uh, what is this Paxlovid versus, versus the Molnupovir, uh, who made them and how effective it is. Paxlovid is up to 90% effective. So we should start thinking of prescribing more and more Paxlovid uh, as much as possible. And if it's not available or is contraindicated for any reason, you can always go with uh, Molnupovir as well. Um, uh, the, uh, there are drug and dr drug to drug interactions with Paxlovid and that, uh, but they are not, uh, they don't limit prescription of these drugs. Uh, and, and that's something that we should consider, uh, in our, uh, in our, uh, arsenal of treating people with, the uh, with the COVID, especially as outpatients, um, and majority of, uh, uh majority of, uh, uh, these drugs are are available, but if there is any issues, you can always let us know, and we can facilitate. Inpatient is still for Paxlovid. Uh, it is approved in very certain or limited conditions, and again, infectious disease service could be contacted for those. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, and we'll switch gears a lot during this presentation because we're covering five different viruses. So switching gear a little bit uh, about monkeypox. Well, what is this? Is a monkeypox virus looks like this under electron microscope? Possibly, it's not colored like this, but it's uh, it's in genus of uh, of pox uh, viridae. There are twelve species, including cowpox, monkeypox, vaccinia, and variola viruses. Those are used for smallpox vaccine. And on the right, you can see pox uh, monkeypox infection on a hand. Um, in uh, in a, in one of the patients, um, so monkeypox is rare, and it's caused by infection with monkeypox virus. It is still uh, it's increased in numbers, but it, if you look at the all the illnesses and diseases, still is limited. It's endemic in part of Africa, but increased number of cases have been seen um, uh, across the world. There are two clear Central African and Western African. What uh, we think is the Western African clade has has changed and has been transmitting more efficiently between individuals. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I started looking at like how long monkey ha monkeypox has been uh, with us. Uh, we have known about monkeypox since 1970s, and the majority of cases that shown in the background uh, blue here, majority of cases have been in Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, they have had over 30,000 cases. You can see on the map on the right, uh, although we have seen some cases in, uh, in 2003 in the United States before this outbreak. I believe there were 43 cases at that time. 
So this outbreak started around May of uh, 2020, May 17th, we detected first cases, and the numbers have increased ever since. Uh, then uh, they, this graphic is showing daily cases with the seven-day seven moving average. Just to give you a little bit of idea, seems like overall cases in the United States are decreasing uh, in numbers. Uh, New York State has had over 3,300, uh, 3,738 cases, uh, uh, and California over 4,500 cases. Other states have had many cases as well. There is no state that hasn't had any cases as uh, as uh, are reported of monkeypox. As, uh, as we know, majority of cases in New York State are actually in New York City. Some demographic of the cases, an important thing over here is majority of patients dis, uh, who have had this illness are male and uh, majority of them, uh, uh, are, and, and there are women and other, other sexes, transgender, non-binary individuals who have, who have uh, gotten monkeypox infection, but, uh, but again, just vast majority are men uh, with, the dif uh, with the different sexual orientations, LGBTQ, um, straight, as well as uh, uh, so several are unknown as well. Uh, this number doesn't match the current numbers because the numbers have, uh, uh, for New York State, not everybody actually has all this information available. So how bad is this? How bad is monkeypox? Uh, so incubation period about 7 to 14 days, um, uh, from 5 to 21 days as well. Prodrome, there's fever, headache, malaise, almost like a flu-like illness, but lymphadenopathy is common. Uh, majority of people, when they come to the hospital to seek care, actually have pustules, which stay on for 5 to 7 days. Those uh, can occur within to three to five days of their um, of their initial um, exposure uh, or initial start of illness, um, it's it's what we have seen is five to seven days after exposure, people are coming in with the lesions concerning uh, uh, either vesicles or pustules concern, uh, concerning for, for monkeypox. How does it resolve? It becomes a pitted scar, uh, like uh, there's. Uh, discoloration of the skin and people are considered non-infectious once uh, the scabs have fallen off as well as new skin has formed and uh, sometimes we extend isolation beyond even 28 days if the lesions are not completely healed in these individuals so spectrum illness uh, one of the things i got really concerned about uh, was the pain out of proportion of the physical findings. People have excruciating pain. Uh, these uh, these, uh, these uh, can um, can be extremely limiting, extremely difficult lenience, both psychologically, but also physically. And we need to be very cognizant, giving people lidocaine and other medications to help ease pain. Uh, the creams and others can be helpful. Uh, fevers, headaches, muscle aches, all are possible. Uh, as I, as we discussed, fallen lymph nodes uh, are are also uh, also something that is 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 uh, spec uh, part of spectrum of this illness. But issues with urination and defecation actually uh, result in hospitalization of majority of these uh, these individuals, including uh, people who are, are having urinary retention or proctitis. Death is still extremely rare. Few cases that have been described um, have, ha have, been, uh, have had other uh, medical illnesses or uh, being extremely immunocompromised. Uh, so how does it spread? Prolonged close physical contact um, uh, the, this could be oral, anal, vaginal, uh, sex, or touching the genitalia of person with monkeypox. Direct contact with the uh, le uh, with the monkeypox lesions, including rashes, scabs, and body fluids from person with monkeypox, and touching objects uh, that are used by the monkeypox uh, positive individual can also spread uh, spread the virus itself. Uh, and the, what uh, what we do recommend in these situations is uh, that, well, the objects that we're talking about most of the time are household objects where a person was living, not necessarily um, that uh, you patient went into a clinic, 
and all the objects certainly got infected. No, it needs to be a little bit more prolonged contact with all the objects to to make them uh, uh, vectors of uh, of, uh, of infection. For, uh, it can spread from mother to children. That's one of the more dangerous uh, situations when children have monkeypox upon birth. There are higher mortality in children. Infected animal bites and scratches, uh, especially people who are coming from Africa who went uh, or uh, used or um, or uh, used or prepared meat over there. Uh, from infected animal can still have infections. And out of all the thousands of infections we have had, uh, some actually are uh, returning travelers from Africa. Uh, what we don't know is if somebody can get infected when the person has no symptoms and there is very little chance we have not seen uh, asymptomatic spread. Uh, we do know asymptomatic infections can occur. How uh, monkeypox is spread through respiratory excretion. So you do see um, uh, uh, that we recommend uh, 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 droplet and uh, contact precautions uh, and uh, special droplet precautions. Uh, in these ca cases, we recommend N95 because the respiratory excretion part is still unclear and we would rather take no chances. Uh, and uh, how do we protect ourselves? So patient placement is important. Uh, closed door, separate room, doesn't have to be a negative pressure room, but a separate room is important. Uh, we need to uh, don the proper PPE and 95 eye protection gown and gloves. Um, and, and what many times a person would come to a clinic, they, we wouldn't put them necessarily in, uh, in uh, or we wouldn't put uh, N95 or eye protection on right away, just because we don't know if the patient has monkeypox or not, and it's disclosed during the interview. In those situations, uh, what I recommend uh, to everyone is, one, as a standard practice, practice we should not touch anybody's uh, rash with our bare hands. And what we have not seen is a person getting infected just by having uh, just by answering questions or just talking with the patient you don't usually get infected uh, so once you detect once you suspect monkeypox come out of the room wear n95 eye protection gown and gloves and then you can continue your interview and that has been the most safest approach uh, there of there has been healthcare workers who've been exposed to monkeypox uh, what uh, what we have seen in those situations is uh, patients, uh, 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 people who got exposed are uh, are uh, people who actually moved uh, the linen or uh, moved the linen aggressively and or were not wearing the proper PPE for extended period of time. The exposure window is about three hours, so it's a limited exposure is not considered to be high risk in majority of these cases. And cleaning, why using wipes, hospital issued wipes are fine. Linen should be. Sent, uh, can be sent it should be bagged but can be sent to the laundry and then room cleaning uh, is uh, is uh, is standard if uv light uh, is available we we recommend it outpatients is not necessary it's not required by cdc or even our own internal standards but if we have it available we would uh, utilize that and terminal cleaning at uh, at discharge is uh, is uh, all that is needed. How do we protect public and treat patients? So antivirals are available. Uh, T-pox, which, which is the name I'll continue to use because the other name is very difficult to see. say. Ticoverimab. Like these are tongue twisters and that kind of make me question why am I doing ID? But then then again, I am doing ID. So approval uh, approved in 2018 by FDA for smallpox, but right now has IND or what we call as compassionate use investigational new drug use a protocol for monkeypox. Uh, and, um, and that requires a little bit of paperwork for, to prescribe this drug. Um, uh, severe, uh, it's used for severe disease uh, like hemorrhagic disease, encephalitis, orbital, or anatomical locations like pharynx causing dysphagia. And we have had patients admitted with the with the pharyngeal monkeypox as well. Genitalia and anal unions all can be the reasons, if, especially if they are causing uh, 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 secondary issues with the patient, can be uh, indications to use T-pox. 
<clears throat> excuse me, uh, vaccine is available is the live virus uh, uh, that is non-replicating and two, uh, two subcutaneous injections, although FDA recently has approved uh, uh, interdermal injections as well. It, it can be used for pre-exposure prophylaxis, especially for lab personnel and uh, for preparedness purposes. Uh, staff have asked if they should get uh, the smallpox vaccine or genius vaccine. Uh, it really depends on the risk, and we have very little control over the vaccine at this time. Uh, most of it is uh, we are directed by by state uh, and uh, CDC on to who to give. We do offer vaccines to uh, to uh, high risk patients and staff who might be high risk because of their exposures. Post exposure can be given given within four four days, which is supposedly pretty protective. After four days, is still not too late, but the protection. Uh, might not be complete and may not prevent the, the illness or disease itself. Um, switching gear again, what is this? So this is influenza virus. Influenza or, or flu is a contagious respiratory illness caused by influenza viruses and causes seasonal and has pandemic potential. Now I'm just showing you a graphic here on the right. This is how the uh, 1918 influenza pandemic uh, uh, occurred. Just looking at the graphic, it actually had at least three distinct peaks of deaths, unfortunately, over, spanning over uh, several years. So influenza virus is, um, uh, it, it can be categorized into three, different sub-viruses, influenza A, B, and C. C does not cause a lot of human infections. So influenza A and B are major pathogens for, for uh, uh, influenza. Um, and on the right, you can see some graphics showing uh, different targets for different medications as well as, well as vaccines. Influenza pandemics have occurred. Uh, at least one million cases in nineteen uh, in eighteen ninety in Russian flu or Asiatic flu. In nineteen eighteen, the Spanish flu had at least hundred million people who got infected. And Asian flu um, uh, in fifty seven in Hong Kong about a million people, and then Russian flu. The numbers are not available. But uh, the way to, uh, and then swine flu re more recently had uh, had been more limited in terms of deaths uh, up to, uh, uh, from anywhere from 18,000 excess deaths to about 200, over 200,000 excess deaths. The way to think about the influenza pandemic is, uh, and pretty much uh, same goes for almost all other pandemics is, a lot of people get infected, some get hospitalized and, few of them die, but when the a, a lot more people get infected, when there's a new type of virus or new uh, genetic recombin, uh, uh, genetic uh, or antigenic uh, shift uh, has occurred, uh, which means the genetic makeup of influenza virus has changed enough that uh, previous protection is rendered incomplete. In that, those cases, we have a lot more illnesses, more hospitalization and deaths. So uh, just a range of annual burden of flu in uh, from 2010 to 2020. And you can see the same graphic, how many cases, uh, hospitalizations and deaths uh, during, during those times. There is not a lot of data available from 2021 onwards for because of COVID. Uh, I, I pulled up a little bit of information from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, WHO because it's going to be a little relevant, just showing different flu seasons over time. Um, and uh, I spread uh, this between the northern and southern hemisphere. So you can see the world on the top left graph and uh, different viruses up to 2020. And then there's a sudden drop till 2022. There is a sudden drop. There was a substantial decrease, almost elimination of influenza uh, in not only in US, but also in, around the world and probably related to both masking and social distancing. 
and increase hand hygiene. The numbers have started to come back when, uh, especially when overall around the world, masking is not practiced as much. And the numbers continue to increase. The important thing here is Southern hemisphere usually ends up predicting how Northern hemisphere will, uh, or how the illness will occur in the Northern hemisphere. As you can see here, Southern hemisphere winter occurs before us, and that helps WHO decide what vaccine targets uh, to use for the upcoming year. Uh, for us uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. What you can see in 2020 uh, to 2022, the number of cases of, uh, of influenza have skyrocketed in Southern Hemisphere. And that's the worry about influenza at the moment that we need to consider as, uh, as something uh, that we need to make sure our patients and we are protected from influenza. So overall, just the estimates over time, that from October uh, 2021 through June 22, uh, there has been um, uh, about th up to 13 million illnesses, uh, 6 million medical visits, 170,000 people, up to 170,000 people hospitalized with flu, and up to 14,000 deaths. This is not a small number, but we have not, uh, we, we have been uh, targeting more COVID, we should always consider influenza in uh, people who have respiratory illnesses. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, just, to, just to give you a little bit of background on the influenza itself, incubation period about one to four days. And I've seen people get infected within, uh, within 24, 48 hours of getting exposed. It spreads pretty quickly. Asymptomatic infections do occur. Uh, there is sudden onset of fevers, chills, malaise, and sore throat. Uh, it's almost like people describe it as getting hit by a bus or train or whatever, it's pretty intense. Um, uh, flu itself uh, has dry cough, sore throat, as well as hoarse voice, stuffy nose and coughing. It can pro uh, progress to pneumonia. Uh, and it, the, the flu itself can cause viral pneumonia, but also secondary pneumonias can, can occur with influenza as well. Dry site is a little bit more detailed graphic of the viral titers within days and uh, how different uh, different uh, um, uh, cytokines in our body are increasing and when does the antibody response occur, which is about uh, starts about five days after in about 10 days, our antibodies are at, uh, are at the highest. There's possibility uh, we get exposed to influenza and because of our antibodies, because of the vaccine, and the immune response removes the influenza before it can cause infection uh, into our cells as well. The resolution of majority of uh, of influenza cases occurs one, within one to two day, uh, one to two weeks, and uh, no COVID like long lasting symptoms are possible. And there's been studies on on long term effects of uh, influenza. What I have actually seen practically is uh, people who get COVID or influenza, it doesn't go away completely within a day or two, within a week or so. It takes uh, several weeks, up to a month or even longer for symptoms to completely dissipate. And sometimes people still have a lingering cough. Symptoms uh, can headaches, uh, fevers, uh, muscle, uh, muscle, uh, overall tiredness, joint aches, vomiting, and uh, and all these symptoms uh, are uh, can be different than um, uh, than uh, uh, than common cold, especially uh, especially when people have uh, increasing muscle and body aches and fatigue and tiredness. Uh, unfortunately, flu is is used uh, more. Uh, like a slang word as well. I got flu. Not every common cold is flu. Flu is, uh, is uh, or influenza is a little bit more intense, causes more illness, and can be more far more devastating than than uh, uh, than uh, common cold itself. So how it spreads? Uh, what we know about influenza is it does spread by by droplets with and droplets can go up to three to six feet from the person who's communicating or coughing. There's always a possibility that some of these uh, droplets become aerosols. So what we recommend is, uh, I'll, I'll get into uh, the protection as well uh, based on all these factors. Uh, 
and the uh, these droplets are made when the when when people uh, with flu cough sneeze or talk and uh, they can uh, land in different areas we can touch them and get exposed surfaces is less often of a mortality but if somebody is sitting uh, sitting um, next to me they're coughing a lot i'm still 6 feet apart but if this the uh, if i go touch the table or the chair next to them and then i touch my face there's good possibility that i can spread flu to myself by just touching there but it's uncommon uh, that also that also require uh, means that we should be cleaning the surfaces in the in these uh, these uh, kind of uh, patients or uh, exposures as well so how do we protect ourselves Droplet precautions are the mainstay, hand hygiene, soap, soap and water, alcohol sanitizer, medical and surgical masks are fine. Eye protection, although not required, but uh, I, I would recommend in, in certain of these cases just to uh, be more, more protective. Uh, how to protect public and treat patients? So public can be protected and should be protected with the vaccines many vaccines are available most of them are without egg uh, or egg components and all of them are considered to be safe even uh, in people with egg allergies people with high risk of egg allergies or allergies to previous flu uh, components could actually be be still given vaccine, but we we need to monitor them a little bit closely. On the right side, I'm showing a, a, a table with the vaccines that are available or will become available within Bond Sinai Health System. All of them are quadrivalent vaccines. Standard dose vaccine will be available for almost all uh, uh, all staff. Staff about 65. CDC uh, has now recommended that uh, that above 65 you should only consider or you should only consider getting high dose uh, flu vaccines so we have flu zone and uh, high dose as well as flu odd um, and both slightly different as you can see the mechanisms but those are available treatment is uh, is is uh, is also available uh, uh, for influenza uh, Oseltamivir and uh, Relenza or Zenanamavir are both available uh, for treatment uh, for patients. Our mainstay of treatment uh, here is Tamiflu flu or Oseltamivir. Belaxo um, uh, Zelzavir has been approved or Zuflenza has been approved by FDA in 2018 to treat flu and B. It is not formulary. It is a different mechanism and not neuromenidase inhibitor. It's a different mechanism called a, a different target cap dependent endonuclease inhibitor. So it's a different target. It's it's It can uh, so if we have certain cases that we are considering this drug, the best is to discuss with ID. Again, it's non-formulary. It's not easily available to us at this time. Uh, a little bit, next, a next table will show you a little bit about flu vaccine effectiveness. But I, before I show you that, uh, that table, just want to tell you that table is really directed towards uh, outpatients who get vaccine, flu vaccine, and then present with flu. So what, uh, and that's how CDC determines flu vaccine effectiveness. What it doesn't show is how effective it is uh, in, in, in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And that's something the CDC should be and is looking into. Uh, but uh, again, when you see the effectiveness graphics and it's low in 30s and 40s, it seems like, wow. That also uh, wanted to show you this because think about COVID vaccine and effectiveness as high as 80% to 90%. That's an amazing, amazing vaccine as compared to the flu vaccine. That also means that flu vaccine does prevent, uh, does prevent uh, um, hospitalizations and that and very few people who get vaccinated uh, result in uh, hospitalized or dying from the vaccine itself, uh, for, uh, dying from the flu uh, flu itself in these individuals in these cases. Um, 
going to the next uh, next graphic. Just um, 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 think, thinking about this uh, uh, this virus. What what is this? It's an enterovirus. It's it's part of a big group of enteroviruses. Um, inclu that includes many popular viruses or many significant viruses, including po polio virus, Coxsackie viruses, enterovirus D68. And, and on the right, you can see a little bit of tree of these viruses. These are all picorna viruses. And these are uh, likely, uh, these are likely um, um, similar in some aspects, similar spreads, but also uh, are widely distributed throughout uh, the, throughout our population. Uh, not all uh, enteroviruses cause cause severe illness, but they include again the poliovirus and enteroviruse D68. Um, so I'm going to talk about both of these uh, together, um, just uh, in the interest of time, but but also because they are in the same family, although they are two distinct viruses. Poliovirus or uh, or, or uh, is it causes an illness called polio is a disabling and life-threatening disease. Um, it can spread person to person um, and can infect a person's spinal cord, causing paralysis. And uh, enterovirus D68, it typically causes respiratory illness. Actually, majority of those cases are respiratory illnesses, although uh, and and some are a little bit more severe than the other. Between August and November 2014, there was a national outbreak of uh, respiratory illness, uh, uh, illnesses caused by this virus. And many of those cases, uh, or several of those cases, had what we call as acute flaccid myelitis, or AFM. It's an uncommon but ser serious neurological condition, mostly in children. Viruses, including uh, enterovirus D68, uh, likely play a role in uh, acute flaccid uh, myelitis. That can also occur from other viruses too. But uh, there's a reason I'm talking about this. We'll get into it in a sec. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so to a little bit of timeline. Uh, in, even in Egyptian artifacts, there are artifacts in, 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 and the picture showing on the left is showing that uh, uh, that uh, people were aware of uh, this flaccid paralysis even in uh, centuries ago at that time. In, 70, in 1789, um, uh, there was uh, uh, th th there are notes about disability in children in lower extremities, and that's probably the first time uh, polio was kind of documented as an illness around the uh, 1980s. Uh, for polio outbreak was uh, 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 in 19 uh, sorry 18 in 1800s. First uh, outbreaks in U.S. were were uh, were uh, were documented uh, around 1952. Um, uh, polio cases increased or rose up pretty substantially, um, uh, paralyzing 21,000 uh, individuals and killing 3,000 uh, uh, individuals at that time, or 3,000 uh, children. At that time, part of the um, part of uh, the reason of uh, mortality in these cases is part of the reason of mortality in these cases is because of paralysis of diaphragm and and that's a picture up there a child who got polio is uh, in a machine called iron lung and that was the technology available then in 1950s and 60s a uh, polio vaccine was discovered and then polio became major for all intents and purposes history although we still continue to see cases and this, these, these graphics are showing worldwide distribution. Um, on the left, oh, you can see since 2000, there has been cases as high as 8,000 cases in different years by, by wild type polio virus. That number has started to decrease substantially uh, to a point um, uh, where wild type polio virus infections are all very rare. 
and uh, last decade the reported polio cases can be seen in uh, in the graphic on the right top where pakistan and afghanistan are two countries where polio still is unfortunately endemic unfortunately endemic on the right lower graphic uh, and on the left side in the in the bar graph i also show uh, a CVD, uh, CVDP. This is the vaccine related poliovirus cases, and they are, have been rising in different parts of uh, of the world. And we have seen a few of these cases in US in last uh, um, uh, last uh, two decades as well. So enterovirus D68, slightly different virus. There's no vaccine discovered in in, in 1962. Occurs mostly in children. Uh, with asthma, but uh, it has been described in adults, and we discussed this in October, uh, in August to October in 2014. Um, the CDC or state health departments uh, have confirmed total of 691 uh, people from 46 states uh, having uh, uh, enterovirus D68, and in around a similar time frame. Uh, um, uh, well, actually, before all this, we have seen the D68 uh, in the left lower graphic. You can see uh, D68 also being found in different parts of the world worldwide as well. Uh, just looking at the disease that concerns, a uh, disease that concerns all uh, uh, disease that concerns uh, 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 us at the moment is acute flaccid paralysis. Uh, 693 confirmed cases uh, since uh, tracking began uh, in 2014, and all these cases have been investigated. Some of these cases were found to have enterovirus D68, and that's why whenever cases, a number of cases of enterovirus D68 increase, uh, we start focusing on that. Uh, this graphic uh, or the map here shows you um, overall um, U.S. wide distribution of uh, of uh, uh, cases that have occurred with acute flaccid paralysis that CGC is in investigating. You can see uh, several cases uh, six uh, since uh, uh, since September uh, fourteen. There have been fourteen confirmed cases in twenty twenty two out of forty reports of patient under investigations. So not a huge number, but still something that is concerning is uh, wide uh, is is uh, spread throughout the the country. So current situation, why am I talking about these two viruses is polio in New York state uh, uh, was uh, there was a New York state uh, notification and also CDC advisory and that in um, in July twenty uh, twenty first of twenty twenty two. Uh, the one case of polio in Rockland County resident was uh, was discovered. Sequencing analysis uh, characterizes these samples as either based on uh, on a vaccine derived polio virus or variant of of a reverted polio uh, seven two polio virus. What it really means is possibly derived from uh, oral polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. There is a lot more to it as well, but this person. Who, who got polio actually was not vaccinated against polio and is thought to have acquired uh, 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 this illness through contact with somebody unknown. And that's where the concern is because the virus they, they detected is very similar to the virus in, uh, in vaccination campaigns, uh, virus use in vaccination campaigns in, in Israel. So enterovirus D68, um, why is that relevant is again around uh, uh, and um, uh, around August, we received a CDC HON or health uh, advisory uh, from CDC uh, that enterovirus D68 was detected in some children in rural centers with, uh, um, uh, with all, all, all seven sites that they have, uh, have been getting specimens. Uh, they they have not seen any increased reports of acute flaccid uh, myelitis. It's something to keep in mind because this virus has been associated with the uh, with the disease itself, with the acute flaccid uh, 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 myelitis as well. Um, just very quickly, uh, a current situation about polio because there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, news reports about water sampling. So with all, whenever there is a polio case or polio outbreak, a water sampling is occurring. It is also occurring in uh, um, in across the world, but they did uh, uh, water sampling and they found gen genetically identical uh, samples in 50, um, uh, 50 uh, out of 57 samples, 50 of them were genetically identical to the one case. And you can see the spread across different counties. I'm not going to get into detail uh, uh, of uh, this. Uh, you guys already know about polio causing flaccid paralysis, but 70% of the cases can be asymptomatic and 24% with minor illnesses, 1% can have aseptic meningitis. And less than 1% has flaccid paralysis in the case in uh, county was, uh, Rockland County was actually patient presenting with flaccid paralysis. So that means there might be hundreds of cases that of, uh, of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic uh, polio out there. Uh, on the right, uh, there is uh, more details about the antivirus D68. Majority of cases, again, are asymptomatic and, and exclusively, almost exclusively causes respiratory illness. That's just, that's, Flaccid paralysis is associated and it can be asymmetric just like uh, polio. It spreads uh, through contact uh, for, uh, for both of them. It's contact with polio, with the contact with feces or fecal oral root, as well as droplet root is associated. D68 is most likely coughing, sneezing, and touching. And how do we protect droplet and contact isolations? And uh, I know I'm almost at the end and at the end of the uh, of the talk as well one last pre, uh, slide is about vaccines because there's been talk about adult vaccines there's a schedule available and i put it there i'll share this slide set with uh, our our uh, our chief residents to send it to everyone um the main thing about is the children vaccines four doses in adults if they are not vaccinated uh, their schedule, they follow a different schedule. If they are partially vaccinated, uh, they follow different schedules. Um, in U.S., inactivated polio va vaccine is available, not oral polio vaccine. The cases we have seen here, vaccine-associated cases, are all associated with oral polio vaccine, which is a live attenuated one. So vaccines we give here do not cause polio. Just putting it out there. And lastly, there's no vaccine for D68 and there is no known treatment for polio and D68. Wow, I didn't think I'll finish it, but this is the end of a very comprehensive talk. All right. You did it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm still digesting all that information. I'm sure I'll have many, many questions. We don't have time to take questions today. Uh, what should people do if they have questions after all this? They can always reach out to myself or my team in infection prevention. Uh, we can always try to unpack. Uh, this was more to make everybody aware of the current situations, of, uh, especially with polio and D68. We, I do suspect there will be not necessarily more cases, but more inquiries from our patients about this. And if anybody wants, uh, I can I can definitely help them out uh, with, uh, with questions or inquiries and, and unpack these things. Excellent. Thank you so much, as always, for your talk. We have an amazing infection prevention team here, a great division of infectious disease, um, and we're really appreciative for all your help. 12.59, somehow you did it. We finished on time. Thanks, Dr. Jabe. Thank you, everybody, for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Thank Excellent you. Excellent talk, Dr. Jabe. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you very much.